Climate change, we have a limited amount of time to resolve it, and it concerns everyone, literally everyone. How could we stay under 2 degrees C? Everybody has to do everything possible. Doing things sustainably is even more modern than modern. But it's a win-win situation. Why isn't it happening? We have one more shot at this in Paris. The fact is that if you don't think you can play a role, you won't. The window is closing, but our window is still open. It's not just why, no. but it's no, why now. Yeah, OK. Why? Why is this year, and I've asked you that initially, why is this year so important? The COP process has been working towards COP21 for years. This is the hard deadline that the climate negotiation community have set for themselves. There are all these people making these decisions on behalf of the whole world, basically. And I don't really, as of right now, I don't, I don't quite understand, like, well, I don't know what's in the draft agreement. And I like, don't... I, I don't even know what the draft is. I'm assuming it's just the entire approach towards the plan. Save the planet, draft 1.0. <laughs> so one of the people who's been in this process for a long time, since, since before the convention was agreed to in 1992, um, said at a meeting in Washington that we're in the third stage here of this global climate negotiating process. The first stage was the attempt to implement the convention itself. And then when the Kyoto Protocol was agreed to, the idea was there's going to be a global regime that will control what everyone does, but not everyone signed up to it. Out of the 196 countries, 192 are in, but the ones that are not in are very big and influential. But we're now in a third stage where there is an attempt to create an actual legal structure that lets all of the countries that are part of this process work together but also lets them use their own sovereign legal systems to carry out their actions. And you don't need a protocol in order to have that happen because not everyone's going to do the same thing. What you need is an agreement that we're, we're following these terms, that the world has decided this is the way forward, and then the question becomes what are the standards and what happens if a country doesn't fulfill its own commitments. In the climate sphere there are uh, very, very weak enforcement uh, mechanisms. Uh, nothing much bad happens to a country that doesn't meet its commitments. So I've been hearing a lot about, about that, the incentives over penalizing countries. Do you feel like this is an, a new approach? Is this set COP21 apart from? Well, I, I, I think we've been generally moving in that direction, not because we think that incentives are necessarily more effective, but rather it's easier to get countries to sign on to them. Right. A country is much more likely to sign on to getting a carrot than subjecting itself to a stick. The way that these kind of negotiations work is you have the framework convention, which has now been ratified by 196 countries. So there are 196 parties to the framework convention. The parties are the governments. And so in order for there to be a decision of the conference of the parties, all 196 have to agree. They have to reach consensus. And it seems like there's a kind of feeling from people working on this that it's better to get an agreement with everyone signed on that perhaps isn't as ambitious as we would want than to try to reach too ambitious and get and get a non-consensus. Does that seem? I think the big correct? question is who signs on to it. We especially need the top five CO2 emitters, and uh, in order they are China, U.S., India. Japan and Russia. China and the U.S. alone account for about 40 percent of global CO2 emissions. So if we can just get China and the U.S. alone, uh, or at the very least China and Europe, for instance, to, uh, to come up with something meaningful, uh, then that would be significant in and of itself, even if we don't get a global treaty coming out of Paris. Well, last November, the presidents of the United States and China reached a very important agreement. It was non-binding, but it was a political agreement that has really propelled a lot of the discussions going forward. These country plans, these national strategies called INDCs, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, will, will enter into legal force no later than 2020. And the thing is that can happen on a sliding time scale because each country has its own legal system and that's where it will enter into legal force domestically. And so how, how much of a part do you think domestic politics will play in Paris? How important are domestic politics? I think uh, domestic politics are most of the ballgame because no country's delegation 
can go beyond what their home government will let them do. So the U.S. election in 2016 will be pivotal, not only to the U.S., but to the world, because it's hard to convince a lot of other countries to take strong action if the United States, which is historically the largest greenhouse gas emitter, is not itself taking major action. So 2016 might be even more important than 2015. All the years are important, but... 2015 is an important framing year, I think. It's like setting the foundations this year. Exactly. Thinking about COP21 and what Joe was saying about it being this third stage, that it's kind of, they're taking a different approach. And I don't know if the approach is better. <laughs> like, I don't think they know if it's better, but it's different, so that's something. They're not doing the same thing that hasn't worked for 20 years. And they're trying to incentivize countries to want to be on board, and then giving them goals that they all agree to, but then allowing them each to fulfill those goals in their own way according to how their economy works, what their resources are, which is where the INDCs come in. So I think it's helpful to keep all that in mind. Also, I think it's helpful to like to break it into the different categories. And what the co-chairs have been talking about are the four pillars that they see holding up COP21, which are the INDCs, the finance, the agreement itself, and what they're calling climate action, which is kind of vague, but I think climate action is everyone else, so civil society, citizens, private sector, industry, that they Oh, need, it's across the board. It's across the board. They need all of them on board as well. And Paris needs to send a signal to the rest of the world that this is the direction we're moving in. It's like what you said. It's the start it's like 20, of a movement. 2015 is the start. And it's important because it is signaling everything to come. Even if we break it down, though, I feel like we still need it'd be good to, like, it's hard to know what to look for. So if, if you were to kind of put on a, on a post-it note what I need to know about COP21. Yeah, in, in, in uh, one and a half minutes. If we had to, like, really, really concise, if we had to, like, fit it, write it down and fit it on a post-it. Keep an eye on the level of ambition in the INDCs. Keep an eye on the monitoring and reporting obligations to make sure that the world knows what each country is doing. Keep an eye on the amount of money that the developed countries are agreeing to put forward. Keep an eye on what mechanisms are set up for increased ambition in the years to come because we are nowhere near where we need to be in terms of levels of ambition. The urgency is really underappreciated. Another thing is I think there's plenty of basis for optimism. We know how to scale up clean energy technologies and we also know how to improve land use practices. So we know how to solve the problem. Yet another thing is that any one particular event or treaty isn't, shouldn't be viewed as the end game in my opinion. I, I really think we need sustained pressure to make sure that we're meeting not just legally binding targets, but scientifically valid uh, targets in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions as rapidly as possible. I was thinking if, if we can make this like a, co like, a, like a collaborative documentary on COP21. Yeah, like we have a pretty good ex extensive network of people within the climate world, but like we're only three people, we don't know everyone. So like within the climate world, like in New York City mostly. Yeah, mostly. But, like we actually don't have to cover everything. We can like link people. This could be an entry point and link people off to additional resources. We're trying to like get people empowered and to get them to be participating. And if like they have a resource that we don't have and they want to share it, like that's great. Yeah. Say like, what do you want to know? Yeah, that's true. That's as true well, like too. send in like, yeah, what do you want to know? What What do you feel like, like you what don't questions know? Questions do you have no. that's that we haven't yet addressed? I don't know. Maybe I spent way too much time watching YouTube, but like we can do YouTube questions or yeah. like submitted questions. Reveal the creative process and then invite people in. sense of what needs to happen in Bonn? Well, there's a very long negotiating text, which is mostly brackets. Most of the key provisions have lots of different sub-options. We need to see progress on narrowing it down. We need to be resolving a bunch of these issues that, uh, that are now open so that the number that remains at Paris is manageable. Okay.